Akuma is like an onion. The more you peel back his layers, the more we get revealed about him, the better and better he gets. Welcome back in you guys to One Piece chapter 1097. My name is Sai, and today we're going to be going through the latest chapter and just talking a little bit about it. So with that being said, let's get into it. The first thing we have this week is another reader requested cover page. I feel like I say that every week, but this time around, it is actually somewhat relevant. Because on this front cover, we have Kuma, Ginny, and his two friends behind him all fishing for some salmon. While yes, this isn't the most lore-filled cover page we've ever had, it's still nice seeing that these characters are being fleshed out on the sideline. And I wouldn't be surprised if this comes back into the anime as a filler scene, perhaps. So now, onto the chapter, we have a little bit of a flash forward. From the last chapter, we now skip over eight years, and we see that Kuma has established himself in Sorbet Kingdom as the local pastor. Every Sunday, the sick and elderly gather at Kuma's church so that he can liberate them from their pain, which is a nice little callback to last chapter where Ivankov calls his paws the Hands of Liberation. One downside to this liberation, though, that no one other than Ginny knows about is that Kuma actually has to take all of the pain he extracts onto himself, because in this chapter, Kuma states that the pain must go somewhere, and if it lingers around for too long, it will just return to its original host, which does make me a little bit curious because on present day Egghead, we learn that Kuma actually extracted his own memories and his memories are just floating around on Egghead Island. So this giant memory bubble right here could be explained in a couple of different ways. The first option is that since Kuma is the user of the Devil Fruit, he has a different rule set from other people. Maybe whatever he extracts out of himself will last indefinitely. Or, the second option is that memories are built different and they don't need a host to return to, or we could make the argument that it can't return to its host because Kuma is a pacifista and he's technically dead. The main reason we're talking about how Kuma's devil fruit could affect himself is because currently, Kuma has sustained a lot of damage. In the last few chapters, a kainu has melted off his foot, a kainu melted half of his head off, Celestial dragons during the reverie were poking and prodding him with swords. Kuma has taken a lot of damage. So with this being the case, it does make me wonder if we'll see a future where Kuma will be able to extract all of the pain out of his pacifista body and use it on someone else. Kuma, presumably throughout the entire series, has been shouldering so much pain onto himself from others that I feel like it's about time someone else had a taste of what Kuma has been going through. So after Kuma heals up the old people, the old people start talking some major smack on the king, talking about how he has been taxing them to death and how he has been starving his prisoners, which is a typical thing a villainous king would do. But I do think that Oda is putting some emphasis on starvation, especially in this final arc, because at the end of Wano, Luffy said he wanted to create a world where all of his friends can eat freely, and I'm assuming the people of Sorbet Kingdom would not be an exception to that. So we fast forward a little bit and we see that Ginny, who is still hanging around Kuma at this point, wants to marry him. My man Kuma finally made it into the big leagues, but he ends up turning her down, which is quite justifiable. Because if they get married and have a kid, and that kid has buccaneer DNA, the whole cycle would just repeat. What happened to Kuma's father and mother? What happened to himself and Ginny? And not to mention, if their kid has that DNA, they're also going to be enslaved. There is no winning in this scenario. The only way for Kuma and Ginny to live happily ever after together would be if someone were to change the entire world. And what do you know? Kuma flips open the newspaper and that is when he sees the Freedom Fighter Dragon is doing just that. He's going around, overthrowing kingdoms, and saving lives in the process. Just like how Luffy had Shanks to inspire him on the path of becoming a pirate, it looks like Dragon is Kuma's inspiration here. So after Kuma reads up on the newspaper, we see the two kids from last chapter, now aged up, are visiting Kuma and Ginny's home and bringing them a basket of fish. And this is where it gets kind of interesting, but not really. So depending on which scan you read, they name these guys very differently. So on TCB, for example, they call these guys fishmongers. 
but on OP scans and a couple of other sites, they call them Gyo Gyo, or at least the front one, they call him Gyo Gyo, which translates to fish fish, but very badly. I know it's not the most interesting thing to talk about, especially since these guys aren't even here present day on Egghead with Bonnie, but it's either Oda didn't give these guys a name and just called them fishmongers the entire time, or these guys are actually just named Fish, which is even more sad. And even just going back to the cover page, where Kuma's catching salmon in the river, you see these two guys in the background. What is with these guys and their love for fish? So now, we go on and we have yet another time skip. We are now 22 years before our current story, and we see that the King of Sorbet Kingdom has just made a drastic change to the island. He made it to where the north side is where all the loyal, tax-paying citizens live, and the south side of the island is where all the poor outlaws of Sorbet Kingdom live. He essentially just annexed his own country because he wants to pay the Celestial Dragons their rightfully due holy tribute. It's actually crazy just how far this king is willing to go to suck up to the Celestial Dragons, and the Celestial Dragons haven't even visited Sorbet Kingdom once in this chapter. Pretty insane. But since the Celestial Dragons aren't here, the king decides to become one himself because he starts using the people from the southern part of the island as slave labor. Kuma obviously, doesn't like that too much, so he tries to fight against it. He drops a massive Urusu shock, but it doesn't really do him anything because the king's forces end up overpowering him and capturing him. Ginny and Gyogyo, or Mr. Fishmonger, depending on which one you want to go with, both end up being captured as well because they wanted to start a ruckus to save Kuma to no avail. But thankfully, we have another person coming to save Kuma and Ginny and Gyogyo or Fishmonger, and that person is Dragon and Ivankov. So, a couple of things with this, but depending on which translations you've read, the word that Dragon says when he first arrives in this country is very different. So, on TCB, Dragon says you make me sick, but on OP and some other websites, Dragon says you insects. Of course, since I haven't seen the Raws and the officials aren't out yet, we don't really know which one they're going to go with, but I do think the word choice of insects is very interesting, because Saint Saturn has repeatedly called humans insects. So I do think it would be a nice twist if just like how Dragon is, you know, making the Celestial Dragon starve over at Marie Joie, it would be nice if Dragon also throws the insect word back at corrupted nobles and celestial dragons. So after Dragon frees our protagonist Kuma, we get an amazing double page spread where we see the freedom fighters in action. And you may have noticed this, but in the double page, Dragon is not sporting his iconic face tattoo. He is wearing it on his leg, just like in the Ohara flashback, but it is not on his face quite yet. And if I had to take a guess why, it's probably because he is still a freedom fighter by this point in the story. And that is why by the end of the chapter, when we have that additional eight year time skip, Dragon does have it because he is the leader of the Revolutionary Army. There could be some deeper meaning to it, but for now, that's what I'm going to go with. As a freedom fighter, it's on the leg, but as the RA leader, he decided to put it on his face. A cool detail and a small reveal Oda put in this chapter would be the freedom fighter ship. We actually see that they had their own logo, and it was not the band on Dragon's leg even. It's actually this sword with multiple spikes coming out of it. And it looks cool, and I feel like there's some deep meaning behind this, so if you guys have any idea what this could mean right here, please let me know down below. So going on, another cool reveal we have is that we learn that Dragon indeed was once a part of the Navy, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, Garp was harping Luffy to join the Navy ever since the day he was born. So why wouldn't he have done the exact same to his son, Dragon? Dragon, unfortunately though, ended up quitting the Navy because he learned that there's actually no justice there whatsoever. Which does make me wonder what Dragon must have witnessed. Did he witness the cruelty of Celestial Dragons? Did he witness Akainu's brutal justice? Did he witness Marines turning a blind eye to pirates? There are so many different routes that Oda can take with this. But the one route I am looking forward to the most with the Dragon Navy backstory would be Dragon's relationship to Akainu. People have been speculating all the way back since Marineford that Dragon and Akainu may have some bad blood. 
because Akainu was like, hey, give me Dragon Sun, Dragon Sun, Dragon Sun. That is how he always referred to Luffy. So it begs the question of what did Dragon do to Akainu? Were Dragon and Akainu potentially good friends back in the Navy and then Dragon abandoned him when he left? Or did Dragon betray Akainu to some extent? Or did he flub a mission? We don't really know yet. This is definitely one of those times where I wish there was like a two-piece or multiverse piece where we could see what it would be like if Dragon never left. Would Dragon have been the fleet admiral of the navy? Would Dragon and Akainu be side by side fighting together? Because here's the thing, if Dragon was still a part of the navy and he was an admiral or admiral tier character, he would have gotten some sort of nickname. Because Akainu is not Akainu's real name. That actually just translates to Red Dog, and Sakazuki is his real name. Just like how Aokiji translates to Blue Pheasant, and Kuzan is his real name. And then we have Kizaru, meaning Yellow Monkey, and then Borsalino's his real name. What title would Dragon have had? What animal and what color would have Dragon been? And of course, we could go the easy route and say he would have been blank Dragon, but hear me out, in the latest episode of the anime, which of course not canon, but in the latest episode, we had a brand new title given to Dragon that we've never heard of before. When Akainu was receiving reports about the revolutionaries and what they've been doing, somebody called Dragon the Insurgent Serpent, which I just gotta say is a really interesting title. And it makes me wonder if this was based on Dragon's Marine title, or maybe that's just what they call him as the leader of the Revolutionary Army. And yeah, while this is an anime original title, I'd like to imagine Oda is in the Toei studio, at least overseeing what they're writing down. And if they have original ideas, I would like to imagine that they talk to Oda about it first and he gives them approval. But who knows, we don't really know how the process goes down. But yeah, I do think we should keep the title Insurgent Serpent tucked away in our back pocket somewhere. Another thing that's quite nice about the Dragon and Akainu tie-in is that this perfectly falls in line with the Monkey family and their final saga fights. Because we had Garp versus Aokiji at Hachinosu. Here on Egghead, we had Luffy versus Kizaru. The only OG Admiral we're missing is Akainu, and now that we know that Dragon does indeed have ties to the Navy and potentially Akainu, I feel like this could be build up towards that fight. So going back to the chapter, we have yet another time skip, the third time skip in the same chapter, and we see that Ginny is now the East Commander of the Revolutionary Army, and it's about to be the best day of her life. She is about to see Kuma the very next day. She is excited. But that is where the excitement ends, because we cut over to Baltigo, Revolutionary Army HQ, and Dragon, who now has the face tattoo, learns that Ginny has just been captured. We don't know who did it. All we know is that whoever did it caught him by surprise and that they were an unexpected enemy. So if I had to guess who done it, I would say that this is the work of the Holy Knights, primarily because Dragon has recollection of what the Holy Knights look like. He's the one who gave us the Holy Knight silhouettes. So I feel like at some point he must have run into them. And what better place and time than right here and now? Another option I've been seeing people play with is that this could be the work of the Marines. This could be Dragon's Navy backstory coming back to bite him. And while I like that option, I don't really see that panning out quite yet. Just looking back through this chapter, a lot of what the Revolutionary Army has done has been directly harming Celestial Dragons. They overthrew the King of Sorbet Kingdom, which cut off an entire island from paying their heavenly tribute to Marie Joie. I feel like this would be something that the Holy Knights would want to act on. Not to mention, but the world government does want to eliminate the Buccaneer race. So by capturing Ginny, it puts Kuma right in the palm of their hands. And this could be what leads Kuma to giving up his life, to becoming a pacifista and even a warlord of the sea. One thing I am really curious about though, is that since we have skipped over and we're now 14 years before the current story, I'm like, hey, where's Bonnie? Bonnie isn't born yet to our knowledge. We haven't seen Bonnie. If this is the event that kills Ginny and causes Kuma to become a pacifista, 
Ginny and Kuma can't get together and Bonnie can't happen in the future, where's Bonnie? I still feel like there's a really good chance that Bonnie is the legitimate daughter of Ginny and Kuma, but I gotta admit, the clone theories are looking kind of solid because it might be their only option. I have no clue. Uh, I'm very 50-50 with this one. When we first got to Egghead Island, I did not believe in that theory whatsoever. But as the chapters go on, I'm like, okay, wait. Th this is starting to make a little bit more sense with each passing page. And another thing that I think is pretty cool, or at least one big tie-in with Ginny and Bonnie, because obviously they have a connection there, is that in the last page of this chapter, you see that Ginny is actually wearing a similar outfit to what Bonnie is wearing back when we meet here in Sabodi. They both have the straps, they both have the white tank top, and they also have the striped pants. The main difference is that Ginny doesn't have the coat and she has long pants, whereas Bonnie has short pants and a giant coat. But yeah, the connection's there. I would love to hear what you guys have to say about how they might be related. Is Bonnie a clone of Ginny? Did Vegapunk create Bonnie? Or no, do you think Ginny will make it out of this situation and her and Kuma will get together for some time? No matter what answer Oda throws our way, the one thing that is for certain is that we're in store for some pain. Oda is building up Kuma and Ginny so much that it is gonna be absolutely painful once he rips them away. But now, on to the comments from the previous video because we have a couple to talk about. The first one we have says, I'm guessing Kuma understood that he couldn't take on everyone's pain alone. So he decided to have Vegapunk clone him to make pacifistas with the intention to make people more happy. And here's the thing, I can see this being the case, but with Vegapunk working for the world government, I don't believe that the pacifista's original goal was to make everyone happy. But I do like this idea because maybe this could be something in the future, right? Once Luffy beats all the bad guys, topples the world government, and we have these pacifistas on the side, I feel like at that point, the Kuma pacifistas could actually be used for good, and it could be what puts a smile on people's faces in the future. Like, just imagine if every island had a Kuma pacifista there to protect them from pirates or corrupt people. That would be a great way for Kuma's memory to live on. The next comment says, Seeing this amazing Kuma flashback makes me really excited for a potential crocodile flashback in the near future. These two have been the only warlords whose past Oda deliberately hid for so many years, and now that we're seeing the past of one of them, the other seems more and more likely. And yep, I know this is a Kuma flashback, but since Ivankov is here, I wonder if we'll get some mention of Crocodile down the road, since we know that Ivankov and Crocodile have some history there. But yeah, either way, I do think this is pretty nice, and this does raise the bar for the other flashbacks we'll get in the future, especially when they have great names behind them. Like, Kuma always had Dragon. But Crocodile... He had multiple run-ins with Whitebeard, so I would love to see what Oda has in store for us there. The next comment says, Wow, so Kuma was planning to take Luffy's pain back on Thriller Bark if none of the Straw Hats would. Technically, Kuma didn't have to since the pain would have just went back to Luffy, but I wouldn't put it past Kuma. Kuma is such a good guy that I feel like if Zoro and Sanji and the rest of the people were still KO'd from the Urusu shock initially, that maybe he would have taken Luffy's pain and then just went on with his day. I mean, hey, Kuma has taken Luffy's pain before. Back in Sabodi, after he saved all the Straw Hats from Kizaru, Kuma stayed there and protected the Thousand Sunny for two years, sustaining major injuries. So the idea of Kuma taking Luffy's pain on Thriller Bark isn't really that far-fetched, and I would have loved to see that, or at least loved to see what was going through Kuma's mind at that point. And now for the last comment, they say, we are really close to chapter 1100. Dragon is definitely going to do the craziest thing. My guess is that 1098 and 1099 will end the Kuma flashback, and 1100 will be on Egghead again. This is where we will see Dragon and the revolutionaries coming to Egghead, and the chapter will end with Dragon entering Egghead Island. I agree. I think that Dragon is on his way, along with Kuma. I I've seen people say, oh, but Kuma's gonna come. I do think Kuma's gonna show up, but I feel like if Kuma is going to make his final stand here on Egghead Island, 
it makes sense that one of his best friends, Dragon, is here to witness his final moments. And one pushback I've seen with Dragon coming to Egghead Island is that there isn't enough time. Dragon is too far away. And I agree, Kamabaka Queendom and Egghead Island are on separate parts of the world. But a whole day has passed, and if Dragon has some sort of wind power like everyone is speculating, him traveling that distance in a single day isn't too crazy when you think about the fact that Shanks was able to travel from the New World all the way to Paradise in a single day as well. Dragon is a character with so much speculation and mystery behind him that right now I want to consider all the possibilities and I want to say that Dragon might be able to do exactly what Shanks did in the past. And of course, I have heard the crazy conspiracy theories with chapter numbers and we all know that Oda loves to play with chapter numbers, but chapter 100 was the chapter where Dragon was first shown. So we go a thousand chapters later, chapter 1100, the dragon could make an appearance here. And hey, if we want to get even crazier, chapter 1000 is titled Straw Hat Luffy. So could chapter 1100 be Straw Hat Luffy and dragon? We could be getting the father and son team up that we have always been waiting for. And if you guys are wondering why dragon would come here, it's because one, Luffy was in the newspaper being barricaded here on Egghead Island along with his best friend Vegapunk dying, but also Kuma went MIA and Dragon was like, hey, where are you going? We're about to make our move. So I feel like it would line up quite well. But hey, that's just a theory and I would love to hear what you guys have to say about that down below. And with that being said, thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. I really freaking appreciate it. Please be sure to like, comment, and sub down below. That would really mean a lot to me. And yeah, thank you guys so much. Thank you to the channel members and Patreon members here on the side. You guys are the best, and I'll catch you guys later. My name is Sai, and I'm signing out.